I would rather betray the world than let the world betray me. This is probably the most representative quote of how the world sees Cao Cao, a villain, a tyrant, the scoundrel. However, there's no historical record to back up this exact quote, although the event of which this quote supposedly is in reference to actually did happen. The novel The Romance of the Three Kingdoms tends to embellish it a little bit more to make Cao Cao seem more, well, bad. Interestingly enough, Cao Cao was actually considered a hero during most times in Chinese history. He nearly reunited the country as the Han Dynasty was fracturing and falling apart. He was respected and admired by his people, and he even created his own style of poetry, which is still celebrated and taught today. Cao Cao was more than just the conqueror fiend that we hear about in the storybooks. He was a man of many sides, and one of which was sword collector. Cao Cao had two treasured swords, and one of these swords is going to be the topic in today's episode of Han Dynasty Weapons. Cao Cao is considered one of the most distinguished military figures in Chinese history, and we know this because there are a lot of records from during that time. We have the records of the Three Kingdoms, and we also have extra, you know, novels and stories like the romance of the Three Kingdoms. Now, because of this, there's just as much fact as there is fiction about this time, so it can often be difficult to differentiate between the two. We do know that Cao Cao was a general, a strategist, and a sword enthusiast. He actually had two swords commissioned for himself. One was called Yi Tian, or Reaching Heaven, and the other was called Qing Gang, which is purple or blue steel. In the novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the warrior Zhao Yun actually stole Cao Cao's treasured sword, Qing Gang. He did this at the Battle of Changban as he was defending Liu Bei's infant son, Ado, and he chopped through Cao Cao's army with that sword. It's a really badass scene in the story, so we'll let Zhao Yun keep that sword for now. What I do want to talk about is the long sword, Yi Tian. Yi Tian was described as a long sword, and though we don't know exactly what it looked like, we do know that at this time in the Han Dynasty, Jian were being less used on the battlefield and were being replaced by the Dao. So uh, it was worn more as a ceremonial or a decoration sword by higher ranking officials to show kind of status and rank. Oftentimes they were embellished with very ornate designs on the pommel, the guard, on the scabbard, and even part of the fittings for the belt hook or the chape on the very bottom of the scabbard. Of course, these swords were still forged as practical weapons. They were made in the exact same way as their battle-worn and tested predecessors. It's just that they were probably not seeing as much battle time as they were seeing meeting time and strategic <laughs> decisions. <laughs> However, it's easy to speculate that the sword was worn for decoration, to represent status and authority. There are actually quite a few existing specimens of Han Dynasty Longjian, with rare material fittings and scabbards with fine embellishments and engravings. Much like this Han Jian that we have from LK Chen, The Soaring Sky. Now, The Soaring Sky is a one-to-one -one recreation of an existing sword and they had the chance to measure and weigh and check all these different aspects of the sword to recreate it as best as possible. Now the blade is quite special. It is called an eight-sided blade. Now it's called an eight-sided blade because of the cross-section of the blade itself. Between the edge bevels and the center bevels on the blade, it has four distinct edges on each side, making a total of eight sides. This particular design is a carryover from Chu Dynasty blade engineering and, of course, before that, the Bronze Age uh, forging practices to allow blades to have a very strong, durable edge, but yet a nice, flexible spine to keep it from breaking in combat. There is a great video made by the Scholar General about eight-sided blades, and it talks about the metallurgy and the engineering behind that, and I recommend that you check that out. I'll leave a, a link to that down in the description below and up here as well, so be sure to check that one out. So let's take a look at the Soaring Sky. 
The fittings on this sword and scabbard are made of cast brass and have specific design motifs, like the raised dot pattern, which is very prominent of the time, and the shape of the scabbard hosts a pattern of engraved circles. Now the guard is actually quite plain in contrast to the embellishments on the fittings, on the scabbard, as well as the pommel itself, which has this very beautiful floral pattern on the disc pommel. Now this is probably because when you're wearing the sword, this is what you're going to see first. And if you have, you know, your clothing overlaps, you probably won't see the guard itself. But it has a very nice, smooth and streamlined design, which I really like about that. In the Han Dynasty, fancy swords like this were actually made with jade fittings, and they would probably have the similar engravings and design motifs that you see on this sword here in the brass fitting. The handle of the sword is wrapped in leather, which makes for a much grippier grip. But it also makes it a little bit difficult to see the actual shape of this. It's actually a rhomboid shape of the handle, and this feels much different. It's something that you, you can't really get the idea until you actually hold the sword in your hand. And you can really feel how it makes indexing the blade very easy because on a double-edged sword, you can do this on either side. But it also positions it in the hand that you have a lot more of your hand backing up the blade. So the, the points where you have the most grip and the most structure are going to be supported best because of the shape of that rhomboid handle. The handle itself is also long enough that you could hold this as a two-handed sword. And with the shape of the disc pommel, it's actually quite comfortable in the hand. Now I've seen some sword reviews that people talk about how they prefer this grip on the sword, but I will tell you that even with the length of this sword being a very long jian and the weight distribution on it, it's still very agile and comfortable in a single hand grip, even to the point where I find this to be a little bit more agile and controllable than the shorter chu jian, which is considerably shorter, but also a much wider blade. So with the engineering that they were able to do at this time, you can still move that blade very quick and nimble, even for its extreme length. Cutting with this sword requires an extra amount of attention to blade alignment and hitting with the sweet spot. This is most likely due to the cross section of the sword with the eight sided blade making it a little bit thicker. But when I cut through water bottles, I simply blast it through and you can see the tops popping off of these ones as I cut through. It had that extra amount of force that just launched those tops. And of course, piercing and thrusting was superior with this blade. It felt like there was nothing in front of me when I was stabbing forward. Now let's see this sword in action. I do need to make a little bit of a disclaimer. This uh, form that I'm doing is not from the Han Dynasty. There's really no records of how these swords were exactly used. Uh, descriptive techniques and military manuals were in much later dynasties. So a lot of how these are used is kind of up to speculation. However, if it's being used on the battlefield, it's probably not going to have very big swinging movements. It's going to be very direct and very simple to get the job done. But I wanted to perform something that really put the, the length of the blade into motion and something, some moments that I consider to be much more advanced in advancing and retreating while switching side to side. And you'll, you'll see how this goes in motion. So could this have been the sword of Cao Cao? Well, we can't say for sure. We don't know exactly what the Yi Tian or any other of Cao Cao's swords looked like because there are no, there's nothing in existence to this day. However, we can speculate that it appeared similar to this because of how long swords of the time were being made and what was fashionable at the upper level of society and high ranking officials would have worn. So the Soaring Sky is probably one of the best representations that we can have of this with an eight sided blade, um, with the embellishments here on the belt hook, as well as on the chape on the scabbard, and of course the, the design here on the pommel. Though these would most likely have been made with more rare materials, especially jade, because it was very popular in, at that time. Again, this, this Soaring Sky is a much more accurate representation than, well, that. <laughs> now, 
If you guys are interested in this sword, I will also leave links to LK Chen's website and some more history that you can look up about these swords. I definitely suggest that you check out the video made by Scholar General. It's really, really interesting. And I didn't want to mention too much in this video about it because you can enjoy his video, especially how much depth he goes into it. So I hope you guys check that out. And let me know down in the comments below what you think of this sword. Uh, what are your feelings on Cao Cao? Mine have definitely changed in looking at the historical records as compared to uh, the books and the novels and the stories from the Three Kingdoms. So let me know what you guys think. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.